You need to start selling your Bitcoin right now. Don't even wait for the finish of this interview. That dollar crisis is coming. How much longer, whether it's a few more months or a few more years, and I'm not talking about just moderate inflation, it's gonna be very severe and potentially hyperinflation. Why should people be worried about inflation now and is inflation temporary or transitory like the government and the Federal Reserve Bank keep saying that it is? Well, first of all, I think people should have been worried about inflation for quite some time because the Federal Reserve and other central banks have been inflating for years. It's just that a lot of that inflation was moving into financial assets. And so a lot of people don't necessarily consider inflation a problem when it makes their stocks go up or it makes their uh, house worth more. Although if you're planning on buying a house, the fact that house prices are going up is not a, a good thing because now it's more expensive for you to buy a home. But I think one of the things that has been helping to offset the inflation has been increases in productivity, outsourcing, uh, the fact that America was able to rely on lower cost imports uh, to replace a lot of the goods that we used to produce ourselves. And so that kind of kept the lid on consumer prices, even though the government was creating a lot of inflation. Of course, absent all that inflation, uh, consumers would have benefited from lower price goods. So the government robbed them of that benefit uh, through inflation. But they've now created so much money the inflationary pressures are so great that it's overwhelming those other factors that were working to uh, restrain prices. And I think that America's ability to rely on foreign uh, producers uh, for all the things that we don't produce is really getting strained. I mean, looking at the congestion in our ports, uh, we really can't even, don't even have the capacity to import the amount of stuff that we uh, now require, uh, nor do we even have the infrastructure to unload it and transport it around the country. Uh, but I do think that you're going to start to see a big increase in the cost of imports. And uh, so inflation is really going to start to manifest itself in a very big way. And it's going to be a huge problem for most Americans. So what is causing this inflation? Is it just low interest rates and the stimulus checks that the Fed sent out? Well, inflation has one cause, and that is the central bank, because inflation literally means to expand the money supply. It's money supply that is being inflated. So that's where the word comes from. Prices go up uh, as a result of inflation, but rising prices in and of themselves are not inflation. I mean, prices can inflate. Right. Prices don't expand. They go up, they go down, but they don't expand. It's the money supply that expands. Of course, it never contracts. That would be deflation. We don't get that. We just get continuous inflation. But what drives the Federal Reserve to print so much money is government deficit spending. So the U.S. government spends a lot of money on programs that it uses to buy votes, but it doesn't want to tax the voters because then it might lose their votes. So there's a big gap between what the government collects in taxes and what it spends. And the gap is filled by the Fed that prints the money so that the government can pay its bills. But that doesn't mean that America gets all this government for free. We still have to cover the cost, except we pay for it with inflation. So inflation is like a tax, and it means that our cost of living is going to go up because the government isn't taking our money it's taking the purchasing power from our money, and therefore we have to pay higher prices. And because we don't have an unlimited amount of money, we can afford to buy less stuff when the prices are higher. And that's basically the same thing as if the government had just taken our money from us, and then we bought less stuff at the same prices. They leave us our money, but prices go up, so we end up with less stuff. So you, know, you kind of hinted at this a little bit earlier, but it sounds like you don't think that inflation is going to cool down in 2022. The Fed and the government have said time and time again that this inflation that we're seeing is transitory, that it'll calm down in 2022. It sounds like you don't think that that's the case. No, I mean, the Fed is just saying what the markets want to hear. You know, if you remember when the subprime market first blew up, 
Uh, ben Bernanke kept reassuring everybody there was nothing to worry about, that the problems were contained. And of course, that turned out not to be true. And in fact, in interviews that I saw Ben Bernanke give when he was no longer Fed chairman, when he was specifically asked about those comments, he basically admitted that he wasn't being honest, that he was just, you know, trying to, uh, you know, put forward a, you know, positive um, uh, spin uh, that hopefully that was going to, you know, help the market or, you know, he was trying to make the, the Bush administration look good, uh, but, you know, really admitted that he wasn't being genuine. Uh, so, uh, I think the same thing is true today. I mean, either the Fed is completely incompetent in its belief <laughs> that inflation is transitory or it knows it's uh, permanent, uh, but doesn't want to admit that. Because the problem the Fed has is that if it admits that inflation is here to stay, well, then it has to do something about it. But it can't do anything about it because if it does the economy will crash, right? The stock market will crash, the bond market, the real estate market, and the government will be forced to slash spending. I mean, right now they're talking about more spending on infrastructure, another huge stimulus. If the Fed has to fight inflation, none of that is possible. In fact, the government has to start figuring out what it's going to eliminate because it's not going to have the funding. So because the Fed doesn't want to do that, it has to pretend inflation is not really a problem because that's the only way it can justify not doing anything about it. But it can't admit that because that will create an even bigger problem. So the Fed's goal right now is to just pretend it'll go away on its own. Now, at some point, it will have to admit that it's not going away, but then it'll try to convince us that it's good. It's a good thing, you know, that, well, you know, inflation turned out uh, not to be transitory, but it's just a sign of a strong, healthy economy. And, you know, there's really nothing we can do about it. So you think this inflation is going to continue ramping up. And, and that's an interesting point that you brought up because I've heard you talk about that on your podcast that the government keeps saying that the inflation that we're seeing is the sign of a good economy, but, <laughs> but it's not. I mean, you're saying it's the opposite. Yeah, I mean, that's what politicians always want to do. They, they want to kind of blame the public for the inflation they create. And they want to pretend that, you know, it's the price we pay for our prosperity. Uh, but it's nonsense because strong economies create abundance, not scarcity. So if you really have a strong economy, you have factories that are churning out all sorts of goods. And because you're producing more goods, the increased supply lowers prices. That's a booming economy. Prices go down, the cost of living goes down, so the standard of living goes up. So a booming economy makes citizens wealthier because there are more goods and services that they can consume. It's a weak economy that doesn't produce enough goods where central banks just print a bunch of money. That's when you see rising prices. So their rising prices are going up because the economy is weak, not because it's strong. So what do you think is going to happen to the U.S. dollar then? Because, you know, we are printing this money essentially out of thin air. We've been seeing this happen in 2020 and 2021. I mean, nothing's happened before. We did it in 2008. What's going to happen to the dollar then? Yeah, well, we've been printing a lot of dollars, uh, certainly going back to the original QE programs following the 08 financial crisis. And... I thought back then that we already would have had a dollar crisis, that the amount of dollars they've created would have caused a big problem already. It hasn't. And that's kind of lulled everybody into this false sense of security that, well, we printed all that money back then and nothing really bad happened. So we can print even more money now and just you know hope for the, the same uh, outcome. Well, we did have bad things happen. We blew up massive bubbles. The economy is in much worse shape today than it was when QE was done for the first time. Uh, the debts are much larger, so we're far more levered up. Had we never done QE, we would have deleveraged. Uh, we'd have a far stronger and healthier economy right now with a smaller government and less debt. Uh, but instead, we have this massive bubble and all this debt. So there has been a lot of damage, even though we haven't had a dollar crisis yet. But that dollar crisis is coming. I mean, how much longer, whether it's a few more months or a few more years, I can't tell you. But at some point, the dollar is going to crash, you know, beneath the weight of all this new supply 
not just the dollars that have been created you know, thus far, but the dollars that are going to be created in the near future to finance exploding uh, budget and trade deficits. But what, what does a dollar crash or dollar crisis look like? What, what does that mean? Well, that means the exchange rate for the dollar really starts to fall relative to other currencies. And what that is going to do is dramatically increase the prices that Americans have to pay for imports, but it's also going to increase the prices that Americans pay for a lot of goods that are produced domestically because the cost of producing those goods will go up dramatically as a result of a weaker dollar. And a lot more of the goods that we produce will end up being exported because the weak dollar will make those goods cheaper for our trading partners. And so as goods are shipped out of the United States, they're no longer available to be purchased here domestically unless the Americans are willing to pay up and pay higher prices to compete with foreign foreign demand. So what should the Federal Reserve Bank do then? I mean, in your opinion, what, what should we be doing to prevent this sort of dollar crisis, well, which sounds like it would hurt the yeah. economy? Yeah. And, you know, the other big part about the dollar crisis is it would bleed into the bond market and force interest rates up dramatically. So not only would the price of goods and services go way up, but the cost to borrow money to buy them would go way up. And of course, the cost of servicing the debts that we already have incurred would go way up. Uh, so it would be a complete uh, disaster of unparalleled proportion. Uh, what happened in 08, you know, would look like a Sunday school picnic wow. compared to uh, a dollar crisis. Wow. Um, but we, we should be trying to diffuse that you know, ticking time bomb right now, but we're not. Uh, because in order to prevent the crisis, a lot of very difficult political choices need to be made right now. And since nobody wants to make those choices, uh, we just continue to kick the can down the road. And so, you know, when the crisis does happen, it just ends up being that much worse. So but what do you do? Like, I mean, we had the pandemic in 2020, should the Fed have not have funded those stimulus programs? Like, what what do we do? Correct. The Fed the Fed should not have funded any of those programs. In fact, we shouldn't have had any stimulus uh, with the pandemic. We needed the opposite of stimulus because the pandemic involved a lot of people just not going to work. Right? People stopped working, and so they were no longer performing services or helping to produce goods. So the economy was contracting. The last thing a contracting economy needs is stimulus uh, because you actually need to contract the money supply along with the economy. But if you just send people home and then say, hey, don't stop spending money, so we'll print up money and give it to you, <laughs> that's a disaster because they're not earning money anymore. So they have to reduce their spending. So what we needed during the pandemic was for people to spend less because they were earning less. But we made the mistake of saying, look, go home, don't make anything. But keep on spending as if you still had a job and here's the money. And now we're experiencing the adverse consequences of that in massive increases in prices. So uh, the government did the wrong thing. Now, of course, had the government done nothing, the recession would have been deeper and longer lasting. And the bigger problem is that Americans had no savings. I mean, we when Americans stopped earning, they had no money to pay the rent or to, or to buy groceries because they live paycheck to paycheck. Well, why is that? Well, because the Fed keeps interest rates at zero and nobody saves and the government has such high taxes, people can't even afford to save. So we have this gigantic government and 0% interest rates. And that's why the economy was so ill-prepared for the pandemic. I mean, it was ill-prepared for any crisis. It didn't matter what it was. I mean, we were a bubble in search of a pin and we found one. So then what do we do now? Do we need to raise interest rates? Do we, uh, the Fed is already talking about tapering their asset purchases. What is the solution then if we want to not see this sort of dollar crisis, if we don't want to see the sort of crazy inflation into the next few years, what do we do? Yeah, well, the Fed should not just taper QE, it should halt it right now, just stop doing it. Not just gradually reduce the amount of QE, that's adding gasoline to the fire. Maybe they're as adding less gasoline, but you don't put out a fire by pouring less gasoline on it. 
You, you got to, you know, stop, stop that or put water on it. So the Fed has to go cold turkey. Just right now, no more QE. In fact, we need the reverse. We need quantitative tightening. The Federal Reserve needs to start selling treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. It has to let interest rates go up and not just a little bit. They need to go up a lot. And of course, when that happens, the whole house of cards literally is going to come crashing down. The Fed has to let stocks crash. Let real think, estate crash. Let bonds crash. I think what you know that's a hard thing for anyone, the Fed, exactly. the government, well, people yeah. to swallow, because <laughs> like, no government is going to want to see the economy crash under their presidency. It doesn't right, matter if exactly. it's Biden or Trump. Exactly, because none of these guys have any integrity. They don't give a damn about the country. They just want to make sure that they don't get the blame uh, for the, the the collapse. So, as I said, we kicked the can down the road. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to get away with it because ultimately the price that we're going to pay for not doing the right thing is going to be enormous because we are going to have a currency crisis. We may have hyperinflation. And all of that is much worse than just letting the markets reprice uh, to a realistic level and letting investors lose money and forcing the government to cut spending. If we continue until we have you know hyperinflation, we wipe out everybody and it's the losses are going to be far more painful for a lot more people. But how likely is that, the hyperinflation? We saw Jack Dorsey tweet out hyperinflation. Now, obviously, he's involved in the cryptocurrency space. But like, how worried should somebody be about that? They should be worried. I mean, it's not like it's a guarantee or even the most likely outcome, because I think we still have time to avoid hyperinflation. Uh, but obviously, the time will run out at some point if we, if we don't do something. But there is no way to avoid hyperinflation without a lot of pain. Now, of course, hyperinflation will be even more pain, but we have to be willing to bite that bullet and do it to ourselves rather than waiting for the crisis to do it to us. So you made a very good analogy or a very interesting analogy on one of your podcasts. You were comparing the Soviet Union to the United States, the way that we are running our economy. Could, could you elaborate on that a little bit and, and why you think that we're doing some similarities to, to the Soviet Union? Well, I, I think when if you're if you were listening to my recent podcasts, I was just comparing the rhetoric or the propaganda that the Soviets used to rationalize, um, you know, shortages of goods in their country and the relative abundance in the U.S. You know, because back in the 1950s or 1960s, you know, the Soviets would see images of stores in America, supermarkets with all sorts of products on the shelves, you know. But in the Soviet Union, the, the supermarkets, the shelves were empty. There was nothing there. And but the people were being told that, you know, the Soviet Union was, you know, the workers paradise and America was where the evil capitalists exploited the workers. And so everybody in America was poor and all the Soviets had so much more money. And so it was confusing for them when they saw all these products. And the way the uh, Soviet Union spun that is they said, well, that's because Americans are so poor, they can't afford to buy anything. And so the <laughs> products just sit unsold on the shelves. But in the Soviet Union, the workers have so much money, the minute products are on the shelves, they buy them right away. You know, and, and, and then they would say, and you know, the American problem is a very difficult problem because the Americans will never have enough money to buy those products. However, here in the Soviet Union, since we already have so much money, well, eventually there'll be products to buy. But, you know, you've got all the money. And, you know, of course, that all made sense uh, until you, you know, really thought about it, because the hard part is producing the products. Anybody can print money. Right. And that's what the Soviet Union did. They printed a lot of money, but there were shortages of everything because nobody made anything. Uh, and now the U.S. government is trying to tell Americans Oh, the reason prices are going up is because of supply shortages. It's not supply shortages. It's, it's a surplus of money. You just can't print money and give it to people and expect there to be goods to buy. The goods have to be produced. Demand has to come from supply. If you just print money and create demand, you can't get supply. Demand can't, can't create supply. Supply is what creates demand. Just because people want something doesn't mean it's going to magically appear. Stuff has to be produced before you can consume it. 
It's interesting. And I, I want to talk about stagflation, uh, kind of switching gears, because I have read a lot of reports of pretty much everyone denying any uh, stagflation happening right now, saying that we're not in a stagflationary environment. There's nothing like the 1970s. Could you tell us what is stagflation mm -hmm. And are we experiencing or are we at risk of any sort of stagflation? Yeah, I mean, we've already got it, I think. And of course, it's the worst case scenario. It's the Fed's worst nightmare. So what they're is never going to admit it? it. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because the reason we even call it stagflation is during the 1970s, we were faced with a situation where we had high unemployment and high inflation. And the economists of the day, Keynesian economists, thought this was impossible. They believed that the only way you would have high inflation is if you had a strong economy with low unemployment. It was thought that high unemployment in and of itself meant that you would have low inflation. There was a trade-off. They, they talked about the Phillips curve. And so this completely perplexed the Keynesian economists because they were confronted with something that their textbook said couldn't happen. And so then they came up with the name stagflation to describe this thing that they thought was impossible. Well, the reason they thought it was impossible was because they don't really understand economics. I mean, the whole school of thought is complete nonsense. Uh, I always say that Keynesianism to economics is like astrology to astronomy. I mean, maybe there's stars there and stuff, but it's got nothing to do with actual science. <laughs> uh, but, you know, historically, normally it's weak economies that have rising prices. You know, strong economies have lower prices, falling prices. So we've got stagflation. But the reason it's a big problem is because the Keynesian tool book is very simple. If the economy is weak, you print money to stimulate it, right? If the economy is strong, right, then you withdraw money from circulation. So and they also do that through interest rates. So weak economy, recession, cut interest rates. Strong economy, inflation, raise interest rates, right? Well, what happens if you've got a weak economy and inflation at the same time? You can't cut and, and raise interest rates together. You can't have a, a loose money and a tight monetary policy simultaneously. So the Fed has got to pick its poison. Right? Is it going to try to stimulate the economy or is it going to try to fight inflation because it can't do both? And if it tries to stimulate the economy, the act of stimulating the economy will make the inflation problem even worse. So not only does it have, would the Fed ignore the inflation problem to try to stimulate the weak economy, but in doing, it would make the inflation problem even worse. So that's why it's the worst possible outcome for the Fed. It's the outcome that we have. And that's why they have to completely deny it exists. So then how would you solve that? Because in the 70s, they had to really raise interest rates in the, in the 80s to, to combat what we were seeing yes. in the 70s. Well, that's what, that what Paul Volcker, the Fed ultimately decided in 1980 that it was going to fight inflation regardless of the impact it had on the economy and employment. So they took those type of decisive actions to fight inflation. That was their primary goal. Well, if the Fed were to do that, it would require a similar commitment to tight money. The problem is when Volcker did it, the national debt was a small fraction of what it is today. Uh, corporations and individuals had much less debt. And the nature of the debt was different. The U.S. government's national debt was financed with 30-year bonds. Now it's financed with one-year T-bills. So when Volcker raised interest rates up to 20% in 1980, wow. it only impacted the new borrowing. It had no effect on the national debt. But if we were to raise interest rates now substantially, even five or 10% for, you know, well, 20, but the entire $30 trillion national debt would be infected and in, impacted. In fact, I think 10 trillion of the debt matures in the next year. So all that low Holy interest cow. rate debt would have to roll over in this higher interest rate environment. Back in the 19, in 1980, nobody had an adjustable rate mortgage. They didn't exist. Now you've got a lot of people that have adjustable rate mortgages. Look at the credit card debt 
that we have now that we didn't have then. I mean, everybody, corporations have a lot of short-term debt. Look how much money they've borrowed to buy back their stock in a low interest rate environment. Well, when we move into a high interest rate environment, uh, this is going to be a disaster. So if the Fed were to do what Volcker did and just fight inflation, regardless of the impact on the economy, uh, it would be a far deeper uh, recession than we had in 1980, 82. In fact, it would be a depression. And the U.S. government would be forced to cut spending massively. In fact, it would have to make deep cuts to Social Security and Medicare, and it may even have to default on the national debt, on the Treasury bonds. It would have to tell our creditors, look, we can't pay. We don't have the money, so we're going to have to renegotiate and, and have a restructuring of this debt because we can't make the payments at these higher interest rates. So there's a lot to unpack there. So I want to kind of dissect what you just said. So part of the reason why we're seeing inflation right now is because the United States government has so much national debt. And so they need these low interest rates and this inflation to pay back this almost $29 trillion with the national debt with cheaper dollars. Now, what this has done is caused a lot of inflation in our economy. And like you're saying, potentially being in a stagflationary environment, the solution to that being we need to fight off inflation through things like higher interest rates. But the cost of higher interest rates are, that means now we have these one-year treasury bills, treasury bonds out there, which means that when interest rates go up, this national debt becomes infinitely more expensive. Yeah, it and becomes a self perpetuating problem because the debt is already exploding because raising interest rates causes a recession. The recession means the government collects less tax revenue, but its spending goes up because more people get welfare and unemployment and food stamps. So the budget deficit is getting bigger, but now interest rates are going up. And so the cost of servicing the debt, if you think about it, if we have a $30 trillion debt, every time interest rates go up by 1%, that's $300 billion extra to service that debt, right? Wow. And so if you get rates going from zero to 5%, that's $1.5 trillion that gets added to the deficit that then needs to be borrowed in addition to the rest <laughs> of it at even or higher rates. Taxes. So it, it, it just implodes. And that's why we're in a situation where the Fed is going to feel forced to monetize all that debt. Because otherwise, it's unpayable. But the, the more money the Fed prints to monetize the debt that nobody wants, uh, the, the more pressure there is on the dollar. So it's either a dollar crisis where we have hyperinflation or massive inflation, or we have a default. We have a, a bond crisis because the government defaults, because the only way to avoid default is through inflation. And I'm not talking about just moderate inflation. It's going to be very severe and potentially hyperinflation. Can you elaborate what you meant by the, the Fed wants to monetize on their debt? What does that mean? Well, monetize the debt is basically when you take the debt and you turn it into money. By, you, you print money and buy the debt. And, and so you expand the money supply, but that means more inflation. Because private lenders aren't going to want to buy U.S. Treasuries at low interest rates, um, you know, th why would you do that? If inflation is 5% and the government says, will you loan me money at 2%, why would you do that? You're, you're losing 3%. Um, so the only way they're going to get the money is for them, from the Fed. But the Fed has to create the money, has to print it. And now you're, you know, destroying the value of the money that exists because you're increasing the supply. And as you have more money, the money's worth less and less. So what does somebody do? Now, uh, clearly inflation seems like an issue. It doesn't look like it's going to go away anytime soon. We got some bigger problems on the horizon. What should somebody be doing with their money to protect themselves against this type of inflation? Well, the worst thing that you can own, obviously, would be any long-term bonds. The longer the maturity, uh, the more you're going to lose. It's funny uh, you say I that because growing up, that was always the safest investment. We yeah, there's talking. no safety there anymore because that's exactly when, when inflation is the threat, bonds are not where the solution is. Uh, bonds do really well in deflation, uh, but they get killed in inflation. And so if inflation is what you expect, then you don't want bonds. Uh, but you also don't even want cash 
because even cash is going to lose value. And especially, let's say inflation is 10% a year. And if you've got money in the bank and it's earning no interest and inflation is robbing uh, 10% a year, after seven years, half your money is gone, right? And, and so why would you just sit back and, and, and watch your money just disappear? I mean, the money will still be there, but the purchasing power won't. And that's what really counts. It's not how much money I have, but how much I can buy with the money that I have. And if you can only buy half as much stuff because prices have doubled, uh, that's a huge loss. So to avoid losing, you got to get rid of not only bonds, but dollars. And you got to get into real things. You got to own equity. You know, inflation transfers purchasing power from creditors to debtors. So you want to own assets and you want to have debt. That's, you know, the government is the world's biggest debtor. That's one of the reasons it creates inflation, because as a debtor, it benefits from inflation. So you want to be a debtor, but you want to have the right kind of debt. I'm not talking about credit card debt, but to the extent that you have a mortgage against your house, that's good because you actually own a house, that a real thing, and you just borrowed paper and you'll be able to repay the mortgage with money that has very little value, yet your house will still have real value because it provides shelter and and all sorts of other things that you get uh, from a house. But, you know, also corporations have debt. So stocks will benefit because the bondholders will get, you know, wiped out and the stockholders will end up owning the company because the bondholders just have a paper claim. They don't have any claims to the real productive capacity of the business. They don't have any claims to, you know, the resources or whatever the company owns. Uh, That belongs to the the stockholders. So what I've done personally and what I'm advising my clients to do is we invest in a lot of overseas stocks, value stocks, stocks that have a lot of real tangible assets on their balance sheet uh, that have good earnings that pay good dividends uh, in foreign currencies. The businesses have a lot of pricing power. They can raise prices to offset uh, rising costs. And, and you know that's what you want to own. And we own a lot of uh, uh, commodity-related, energy, agriculture, mining, um, a lot of precious metals-related investments, gold and silver, gold and silver mining stocks. Uh, these are the type of investments that will do very well uh, in an inflationary environment, in a stagflationary environment. We're investing in emerging markets. Uh, I think those markets will do very well with a weak U.S. dollar. Um, and, uh, so th- you want to, you know, get those portfolios now, uh, before they become too expensive, uh, with the dollar crash. So I want to talk about gold in just a second, but I, I-, I want to question you about value stocks because the concern that a lot of people have is that our economy, our GDP is not going to grow very fast over the next decade, like it has in previous decades. And if our economy is not growing as fast as it used to, doesn't that mean the value stocks are not going to see the same upside that they have in previous decades? Well, A, I'm not buying my value stocks in the U.S. because even value stocks in the U.S. are expensive. They're just value relative to momentum stocks, which are ridiculously expensive. And those are the stocks that are going to crash, you know, even with inflation. Um, but no, we're investing in overseas markets where we actually do get a good value for the money. We're buying stocks at historically average to below average PEs uh, with uh, dividend yields that far exceed the yields available you know, on bonds. So we're getting good value. We're getting good income. And I think these businesses will do well. And what's happened during the bubble is people have been willing to pay a premium for growth stocks. And so much so, there's been so much money going into that sector uh, that the value stocks have kind of just been ignored. And I think that when inflation rears its head in a big way, either the Fed raises rates to fight it or just allows it to continue. But either of those scenarios is bearish for high growth stocks, you know, high multiple, low earning stocks. And I think that as uh, that bubble breaks, and the returns improve out of the value sector, that more of the institutional money that has been flooding into momentum is is going to move back into value. And so those flows are going to cause these value stock prices to go up. Uh, And so therefore, you want to position yourself before 
uh, the herd drives the prices a lot higher. So what about gold? I know you talked about gold. You are a big reason why I started investing in gold a while ago, uh, buying gold. What does gold do, and maybe gold versus silver, what does gold do as a way to protect, protect someone's value in an environment like well, this? Well, remember, so during inflation, paper money, fiat currencies are losing value. And so prices are going up. Um, so gold is a commodity. And the price of gold will go up along with the price of nickel and lead and wheat and oil and cotton and corn, right? All the things that we need, right? All those prices go up. Now, you know, you're not going to load up on cotton. I mean, you know, how much? I mean, I mean, you'd have to have a lot of space to store it, and you'd have to have the right temperature, and you know, uh, you know, wheat. I mean. How are you going to store oil? You're going to have big tanks in your backyard. So if you want to buy a commodity that's easy to store and has a lot of value in a small place, well, that's gold, right? Uh, and so gold is a good hedge against inflation because even if you don't need the gold, you can buy it anyway because somebody's going to need it. Jewelers are going to need it. Uh, computer chip manufacturers are going to need it. It's used in dentistry and aerospace. So it's a commodity that you know people are going to use, but you can store it. Uh, and other central banks also, when there's a dollar crisis and their reserves are in dollars and they're worried about the dollar going down, what are they going to own? The only other reserve asset that they have at their disposal is gold. So you'll have central banks that'll be buying gold uh, and a lot of other investors. So there's going to be a lot of demand for gold in the future as an alternative to dollars or other fiat currencies. So I don't look at gold the way I look at investments, because gold doesn't throw off a return, I look at gold as an alternative to dollars or euros or yen. Because if I bury dollars in my backyard, I don't get a return on those dollars either, right? Uh, so the question is, what do you want to bury in your backyard? Dollar bills or gold coins, right? The gold coins have a much better chance of being worth something in the future than those pieces of paper. Uh, but you know, I'm not buying gold at the exclusion of making investments. I still want to be invested in stocks. I still want to be invested in real estate. I don't want to have all my money uh, in liquidity in, 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 in gold. Now, if I thought everything was overpriced, right? If I thought all the real estate was too expensive, all the stocks were too expensive, you know, all the art, all the other investments, if I just wanted to wait it out in cash, yeah, I would have everything in gold, right? If I if I was of the opinion that every single asset was overpriced, but even then, you know, you you you, you don't want your you know if you have everything in gold, your your opportunity cost is I'm giving up my income, I'm giving up my dividends, and so if you're doing that, you're going to have to gradually sell off your gold to pay your bills because you're not going to get any income from your gold coins. So, like you said, I mean, if if people are worried about a potential market crash, slow down, would it be better for them to hold cash? That way they can come and buy at a discount? Well, it depends on the nature of the crash. If we have a crash like we did in 2008, yeah, they're definitely better off in cash. Um, I mean, being in gold was better than being in stocks because gold was down about 30% and stocks were down about 50%. But obviously being in cash was better than being in gold. But if we have massive inflation then stock prices may not even go down in terms of dollars, but they could crash in terms of gold. So let's say that the stock market, the Dow is what? 30, let's say 30,000, whatever the Dow is. Um, or what is it? 36,000 or something like that. It's higher, but yeah. let's say the Dow is 36,000 and gold is 1,800 an ounce. Let's say the Dow goes up to 50,000, but gold goes to 10,000. The, the, mm. the stocks have actually crashed because the gold price has collapsed. Um, but the nominal stock price has gone up. So if stocks come down in an inflationary environment where the losses are, uh, you know, when you adjust for inflation, then you're much better off being in gold. And there also could be a situation where we're having a dollar crisis and a stock market crash at the same time. And the Dow can go from 36,000 down to 20,000, but gold can go from 1,800 to 5,000. 
So in that type of environment, you can see stocks crashing while gold's going up. So my bet is, given my concerns about the dollar and inflation, if I really wanted to wait out a stock market crash, I'd much rather keep my dry powder in gold than dollars. Interesting. And I'm going to get your thoughts on the stock market crash in just a little bit. But I want to ask you a question I think I know the answer to. And you're not, you might not be happy about this, but a big chunk of our audience, including myself, we, we are uh, also involved in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. But I want to hear your thoughts. Do you think Bitcoin is a safe investment? We're going to jump back into the video in just a second. But before we do, a quick word from our sponsor, Vaulted, because if you're interested in buying physical gold, you need a platform that's reputable, that makes it easy, and that's not going to rip you off with fees, which is why I like Vaulted. Vaulted is a platform that lets you easily and automatically buy physical gold off of your phone or your computer. It takes less than a minute for you to open up an account, and then you can start buying real gold. The reason why I like Vaulted and the reason why I started using Vaulted myself is because they let you buy gold very passively. They have something called the Vault Plan, which which lets you create up an automatic purchase for physical gold. That means you can set up a reoccurring purchase, whether it's $100 or $1,000 for physical gold every single month, and you can see this happen in your app. As soon as you own a physical bar of gold from your reoccurring purchases, you can either have this physical bar of gold shipped to your house, or you can keep it in the vault. So they're trying to make buying physical gold super easy. There are no minimums to get started investing in gold with Vaulted, and they're very transparent with their fees. That way you can have more of your money going to actually buy gold instead of having all your money go to pay for somebody else's commissions. Plus, when you start investing in gold with them, you also get your own metals advisor at no additional cost. So if you want to learn more and see how you can start buying physical gold with Vaulted, I'll put the link to where you can learn more and get started in the description below. Minority Mindset is a paid partner with Vaulted, so if you use them, we will get compensated, but there's no additional cost to you. So if you want to learn more and see how you can start investing in gold with Vaulted, I'll put the link to where you can do that in the description below. And now, let's jump back into the video. Well, I think you know the answer to that. I mean, anybody who... <laughs> I don't know if all the... I don't think all of our viewers do. Well, your viewers are in luck, okay? Because if any of your viewers own Bitcoin under the delusion that they have a safe investment, right? You're wrong, right? And you need to start selling your Bitcoin right now. Don't even wait for the finish of this interview. Just start selling. <laughs> um, because if you're looking for safety... You can't look at Bitcoin. Right? Even if you believe in Bitcoin, you must acknowledge that it is highly speculative. And you must also acknowledge the possibility that it goes to zero. So the only money that anybody should have in Bitcoin is money that they're willing to lose. Right? So whatever your risk tolerance is, do not put one nickel more into Bitcoin than you're willing to lose. So if you've got, you know, $10,000 in Bitcoin, if you can't say, you know, if that goes to zero, I'm totally fine, then 10,000 is too much. I don't know. If you have 100,000 in Bitcoin and you're not okay with that going to zero, it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to affect your life. It's not going to stop you from paying your mortgage or retiring or doing the things that you want to do. If that's your fun money, you have to look at it like, I just took this money to Las Vegas and I know I'm going to lose it. I might make it. I might hit it big, but I'm going to have a good time. I'm, I, I'm willing to lose this money. That's how you have to look at Bitcoin. So if you're not looking at it like that, then just get out of it. It's not for you. Or at least reduce your position to the point that you are comfortable losing 100% of whatever you leave in, in Bitcoin. And that goes with any cryptocurrency. You know, I look at, they're all the same. They're all highly speculative uh, tokens. But... Then beyond that, do I, do I think that these tokens are going to succeed? No. I mean, I think that Bitcoin is just a pyramid scheme, chain letter, Ponzi. Uh, Bitcoin has no actual value, right? It's just a string of digital numbers that does nothing in the real world. I mean, you, you, you don't actually have any utility out of a Bitcoin, right? If, if, if you just have Bitcoin, you can have all 21 million of them and you can't do a thing with them, right? Having 21 million Bitcoin is no different than having one as far as what you can actually do with it, right? Whereas if I have, you know, 10 ounces of gold, 
I actually can do a lot more than I could if I have one ounce, right? I can make 10 times the jewelry. I can make 10 times uh, the computer chips, right? I, I have more gold that I can do more things with. But it doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you have, you can't do anything with it. Um, but people are willing to buy Bitcoin because they believe the price is going to go way up, right? They think it's going to the moon. So what Bitcoin has is the, the potential to make people rich who buy it. And so that's where its value comes from. It's like a lottery ticket that people think is the winner. Like, hey, this is the winning ticket. I have to buy this and I'm going to be rich. Uh, but, you know, it's not like an asset like stocks or bonds or real estate because it doesn't throw off income, doesn't generate rent, doesn't generate interest, doesn't pay dividends. It's not a commodity like wheat or oil or gold because you don't use it for anything. It's not even a currency like the dollar or the euro because it's not used uh, as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account. Uh, you know, it's just used to trade. It's a trading token. And the reason people buy it is because they think the price is going to go up. And why do they think the price is going to go up? Well, because somebody else is going to buy it at a higher price. And why is that person going to buy it at a higher price? Because he thinks there's another person who will buy it from him at a higher price. So, And that's the mentality. And everybody who buys it now feels obligated to convince other people to buy it, uh, you know, and get them to drink the Kool-Aid and, and buy some. And, you know, it's all like a big cult and we're all going to get rich on this fantasy. Uh, but, you know, we've had these kind of get rich quick schemes before. I mean, just because they slap, you know, these cryptocurrencies on it and put it on a blockchain doesn't mean a chain letter or a pyramid scheme is going to be any more successful just because it's digital on a blockchain. So all you young people who think you've reinvented the wheel and discovered the fountain of youth and, you know, us old fogies just don't get it. We get it. <laughs> We've been there. I, I've done plenty of dumb things. You guys that are in your 20s haven't lived long enough to do dumb things. You learn from your mistakes. Right now, the young people are making the mistakes that they will eventually learn from. Right? All the money that your viewers are going to lose in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, hopefully that will lay the foundation for better decisions in the future because they're going to learn an expensive lesson. But what people can do, if you have people who are in Bitcoin who are listening to your YouTube channel, just sell. You'll thank me. You don't have to sell it all. You know, you want to hold on to some, okay, but take some chips off the table. You'll thank me, right? You know, there's an old Wall Street saying, bulls make money, Bears make money, pigs get slaughtered, right? Take some profits, reduce your risk, right? Play, gamble with the house's money. Don't go all in. Don't believe this pie in the sky. Look, if I'm wrong and Bitcoin goes to the moon and you sell half right now, you're still rich, okay? And you can still make money with the other half, right? You can send it to me. I'll help you invest it at my <laughs> asset management company. You can do it yourself. I'll, I'll get you a good portfolio. But see, if I'm right, and you don't sell any Bitcoin and it goes to zero, you're wiped out. So, you know, it, 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 it's fine if you follow my advice and I'm wrong. But if you don't follow my advice and I'm right, you're wiped out. So there's, there's no other uh, rational decision. You got to sell. You can't be all in on any of these crypto assets. So this is, this is a, across all crypto. You think all crypto is going to zero, not just Bitcoin. Well, yeah. Well, what's the difference between them? Well, different cryptocurrencies have different technologies, different goals, different usabilities. Well, not really. I mean, they have different names. I'll give you that. Uh, and they have different pictures on the coins. Uh, but look, yeah, some of them have different uses. But so what? I mean, none of I mean, there's 13,000 of these things. I mean, 13,000. There's not 13,000 different uses. There's a lot of overlap. A lot of them are pretty much, you know, carbon copies of the ones that already exist. And, you know, none of these cryptocurrencies have anything proprietary. There's no, like, patent. Anybody can just create one that's identical to it. It's all open source, right? I mean, anybody can do it. Um, and that's the problem because everybody wants to pretend that they're scarce. There's nothing scarce about Bitcoin if there's 13,000 other cryptocurrencies that compete with Bitcoin. Look at this uh, what, Shiba Inu. What's it called again? Uh Shiba Inu. She, yeah, I mean, that came out of nowhere. And now look at it. I mean, you just you can start <laughs> one of these 
you know, from scratch, that's that no one even heard of that cryptocurrency when the year began. Now look at it. It's worth what is it? 30 billion, 40 billion dollars out of nowhere? And so if that can happen, how is Bitcoin scarce when you could do that? You know, and and an infinite number of times. I mean, there's 13,000 of these things now. I mean, by the end of the year, there'll probably be 15,000. If the bubble keeps on inflating, maybe the, the supply will double next year. There'll be 30,000 of them. I mean, th- th- there's no difference. They just keep creating them. Yeah, I, I agree that it, there's a lot of volatility, a lot of speculation, a lot of potential risk behind it. You have to be smart when you do that. But, you know, well, well I guess we'll see what happens if, if blockchain stays on and if there's any future technology with blockchain. And I'm glad you gave your opinions because what I always say is you need to hear both sides. You got to hear from both people's opinions. So I'm very glad that you were able to educate our audience on your opinion. But what, so I, what, I thank I you mean, for what that. Makes you th- I mean, if you think Bitcoin has value... What is the value of Bitcoin? Because no one has been able to convince me it has any value. Sure. Well, if I have, I have gold bars. Now, if I want to go travel around the world and I want to spend my money in India and I have gold, it's very difficult for me to do that. It's very difficult for me to travel around the world with gold in my pockets and do that versus me transporting something like a cryptocurrency is very easy. It's on my phone. It's very easy for me to do it off the grid. And it's very easy for me to now make these type of transactions. We have writers here for our team that are overseas. They couldn't accept PayPal. They couldn't accept some other sort of payment. And so what we did was we sent them cryptocurrency. And now within five seconds, we had spent hours. Yes if not days, trying to figure out how to pay them. I I agree with you that it is easy to transport Bitcoin because you're transporting nothing. And so when you're transporting nothing, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Well, I'm transporting my phone, right? Bitcoin is on my phone. Cryptocurrency is on my phone. And it's it's, there's there's something there. You could actually do the same thing. If you like blockchain technology, you can do the exact same thing with a cryptocurrency that's backed by gold or something real. So I can I can have gold in a right. vault somewhere and my ownership can be registered on the blockchain and I can have a cryptocurrency that represents a fractional ownership Absolutely. interest in a bar of gold or multiple bars of gold. And I can just as easily and just as inexpensively, probably more inexpensively and even quicker and easier, I can transfer my ownership of that gold anywhere in the world through my cell phone. So you exactly. can have cryptocurrencies backed by gold. You can have them backed by silver. You can have them backed by whatever you want. They can be backed by coffee. They can be backed uh, by, by, by copper. They can be backed by oil. You could back it by real estate. You could back it by stocks. You could back crypto with anything. It makes no sense to back it by nothing, right? It seems to me that a cryptocurrency that is backed by something real will always have value and will be more appealing than a cryptocurrency that's backed by nothing. Because to me, the difference is real currency versus fiat. Real currency is backed by gold. Fiat currency is backed by nothing. So Bitcoin is fiat, right? It's a currency backed by nothing. All you have is faith and confidence. But if you have a cryptocurrency backed by gold, then what gives the cryptocurrency value is the gold that backs it up. You don't have to have confidence. You just need to know that there's gold there. But you've just showed that you believe in the blockchain because there are stable coins which are backed, pegged by gold. And in order to do that, you have to use the blockchain. Yes, but you in order don't to have to use the Bitcoin. stable coins. You don't need Bitcoin. You don't have to use Bitcoin. But 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 the Bitcoin, you're talking about the value behind Bitcoin. But, bi- gold but, things. but when I own Bitcoin, I don't own the blockchain. I don't own anything but that token. So my point is that everything you like about Bitcoin, you can have all that with a cryptocurrency backed by gold. But then you would have all the positive attributes of gold and you combine that with all the positive attributes of Bitcoin. But the problem with Bitcoin is when there's no underlying value to Bitcoin, you can transfer it around until the price collapses because people realize it has no value. Because simply being able to transfer it doesn't give it value if ultimately what you're transferring has no value. Well, it takes time, effort, and labor to mine an ounce of gold, correct? Yes. Just like that, it takes effort to mine Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies through different types of 
work which you have to show through your computing power on your computer or by staking certain cryptocurrencies so it's a different type of work well just because and something young people, requires well, young people well just because but, something but, yeah. requires work doesn't automatically mean it has value you have to produce something that people want i mean for example if i hired somebody to dig a big ditch right and then when they were finished digging the ditch i paid them more money to fill it back up again Right. So at the end of the day, there's nothing there. Right. At one point there was a big hole, but now it's filled back up with earth. So that person worked all day, but actually didn't produce anything. What was there any value created from all that work? Well, let's see what happens uh, in 10 yeah, years. I mean, you're you know, young people, young people right now do everything on the Internet. Young people have grown up only on the internet. They've grown up purchasing skins in games like Fortnite. Yes. They're paying real dollars to buy Gucci and Louis Vuitton skins on Fortnite. Look, I understand so, that, but they're not living in digital houses. They're not eating digital food. Uh, there are certain things that you can't do on the internet. You need in real life. And, and, and money is, you know, you have to have actual, you know, they, they're saying that Bitcoin is digital gold. It doesn't work. In no more than digital food, you know, or digital house. And, you know, and, and people are playing these games for entertainment. Uh, it is not, you know, hey, I'm going to get rich off of buying some product on, on a video game. So this is a collective delusion. This is, you know, you know, like, like tulip mania. I mean, you, you can look back, right, and think, Gee, I have a poster of tulip mania in our office. Right, and you I understand and look, where you're coming from. The people from. that were buying those tulips in Holland were as convinced as you are that they were going to get rich. You know, and I'm sure <laughs> look, there was. A, I'm not saying there must have been. We can definitely see another 2001 style crash in cryptocurrency. It's very possible. Are there a lot of scam coins out there? Yes. Is there a lot of risk out there? Absolutely. Yeah. Is there a lot of crap out there? Absolutely. Is there real value out there? Well, I guess let's let time decide. Yeah, I, we'll I think see they're all. Really it's all crap, the right? They're all shit coins, or whatever you want to <laughs> describe them. There, there, there's no. When I, I I laugh when I hear the Bitcoin people making fun of. Dogecoin or Shibu Inu, you know, but you know, when you live in a crypto house, you can't throw stones because they're, it's all the same. Any criticism well, you have of those coins, you can make the exact same criticism about Bitcoin. Sure. So uh, we know that you think that we're going to see a crash in the cryptocurrency market. What about the stock market and the real estate market? I know you predicted the 2008 real estate crash. You were one of the few people who came out there and bet against the or talked about the entire real estate market before anybody else did. What do you think is going to happen in those asset classes? Well, there is definitely going to be a crash. It just, you know, depends on against what. There will definitely be a crash in terms of gold. So the price of stocks, the price of real estate, and the price of cryptos are all going to come way down in terms of gold. Whether there'll be a crash in terms of dollars all depends on how much inflation there is. You know, because let's say the dollar loses 90% of its value, but stocks only lose 50% of their value. Stock prices will go up in, in, in that environment because you're measuring it against a currency that's lost even more value than the stocks. But gold will go way up. So gold will be the real barometer. And that's how you'll be able to measure real value. And it's clear to me that all these assets are way overpriced in terms of gold. And so the price of these assets will go way down in terms of gold, regardless of what happens to prices in terms of fiat dollars, because there it's a moving target. And, you know, if the Fed prints enough money, stock prices will never go down. I mean, nominal stock prices. I mean, look at Zimbabwe. I mean, they had the best performing stock market in the world in their own currency. But, you know, when you measured it in terms of dollars or euros or gold, the market was crashing. Uh, but it didn't crash in its own wow. currency because the currency crashed more. So you think that the way to protect yourself against a, a real estate crash, stock market crash, which you think is bound to happen, is to own gold. When you start to see the prices of gold go up relative to these assets, then you can convert your gold to stocks and real estate? Yes, you could use your gold. That's your liquidity. And you can buy assets uh, much cheaper then it would cost could you it, to buy those assets today. Could it ever be an issue where, where you wouldn't be able to liquidate your gold? Have you ever seen anything like that happen in history? Well, I mean, to the extent that governments put a big tax on the gains or if they try to seize it. I mean, gold is kind of hard to seize if you have it physically because, you know, they have to come and find it. 
Was it illegal to own physical gold in the early 1970s? In monetary form, yes. Uh, but you, you know, you could own gold jewelry. Uh, like, you know, I've got a gold watch, so this wouldn't have been illegal. Uh, but, you know, having a bar of gold was illegal, but nobody really went to jail for it. I mean, if you had, it wasn't like the government had, you know, FBI agents knocking on people's doors looking for gold. I mean, people had gold. Uh, they just were breaking the law, just like people, you know, people have drugs. It's against the law, you know, but they have it, you know, uh, you know, and, and again, the government's not just raiding everybody's house. It's not a high priority to try to, you know, find people that have gold coins. So what, what about stocks like Tesla? Uh, you, I know you talk about this pretty uh, openly, pretty commonly, and Kathy Wood, who is investing in some of these growth stocks. I think a lot of young people are very interested in these, these growth companies, these tech companies, they're lured by them. And then you look at some of the price to earnings and they seem kind of crazy. I know you've talked about Tesla and their Hertz order quite a bit. What do you think is gonna happen to them? Look, I mean, Tesla is an extremely expensive stock that keeps getting more expensive. And I think a lot of people gave up shorting it a long time ago because they lost too much money. Um, and that's one of the reasons probably the price keeps going up is because people are afraid to short it. But that also means when it eventually starts to go down, you're not going to have a lot of shorts looking to cover. Uh, so that could mean you know, a much bigger crash. You know, when you have a lot of shorts in a stock, it cushions the crashes because the shorts come in and buy. But if you don't have a lot of shorts and then the market starts to crash, you know, that buying's not there. So uh, one of these days, Tesla's going to crash, uh, you know, in a big, big way. Uh, I don't know when that is because right now the fundamentals don't matter. It's just the momentum. And as long as the momentum is there and people are willing to buy it, just like, you know, it's just like Bitcoin or anything else, right? If people are willing to buy it, the price could go up. But at the end of the day, I don't think there's any way that the company can ever deliver enough value to make the stock a good investment at this price. Even if the price goes up from here, I don't think they're ever going to earn enough money selling electric cars uh, or whatever they end up selling to justify the price. I mean, I do think that, you know, over time, all of the other car companies will be competing more aggressively with Tesla. You know, I mean, more companies are going to roll out electric cars. I mean, they were one of the first companies to really, you know, make them. Uh, but their success in electric cars means a lot of other companies are going to imitate that. And they're not going to have the market to themselves. They already don't. I mean, I have two electric vehicles and neither is a Tesla. I've got a all electric Jaguar uh, and I've got a hybrid uh, Porsche. Uh, and now when I bought my hybrid Porsche, they didn't have any all electrics. Now they have a fully electric Porsche, but all sorts of uh, cars are coming out. A lot of high end sport cars. A friend of mine uh, uh, here uh, just bought a all electric a Ferrari. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, the high end cars are now coming out in electric, uh, but, you know, more uh, average, uh, you know, cars, uh, economy cars. I mean, there's going to be more and more electric cars. And, and so Tesla is going to have a lot more competition in the future. And, and, and so to, to say that Tesla is worth more than all the other auto companies in the world combined, whatever it is, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense that it's that valuable. Uh, and, you know, but that doesn't mean the price can't go up. Of course, it can go up, uh, but eventually it's going to come crashing down. I, I just, I'm not smart enough to know when that is. But I do know that and, and when you, it does you're crash, this is across this when it crashes, uh -huh. most people won't get out. I mean, because they can't get out. <laughs> so a hmm. lot of the people who have paper profits in Tesla will lose those profits. They will not get out. The stock will crash and they'll be a passenger uh, and uh, it, it, it'll be pretty fatal for their portfolio if they're way overweighted in Tesla, which is why at a minimum, if you own Tesla, take some money off the table. I mean, you got to pare down that position so that when it does crash, you know, you're just losing back, you know, 
house's money. You know, take not only take some of your original money off, but take some of your profits. Bank some of the profits. Don't lose them all uh, and put them someplace else. You know, don't get greedy. Don't keep everything in that stock because you're afraid you're going to miss out on another big move. You won't miss out on it if you don't sell all of it. Just sell some of it and, and, and take advantage of some other opportunities. Get involved in, in something else that might, might go up. And this is, you would say, not just for like Tesla, but pretty much across the range of these uh, startup growth stocks, these early, early, early stage companies? Yeah, I mean, if you get a huge gain in any of these little companies, it makes sense to take something off. You know, because you don't want to just watch all the gains disappear. Yeah. And the last thing I want to talk about in this interview is, is the trade deficit. Because the trade deficit in the United States uh, has been getting worse. And it hasn't been getting a lot of coverage. So I'd like you to cover first, what is a trade deficit? Why does it matter? And what does this mean for our economy and us? Yeah. So nations trade with one another. And their relative balance is either in surplus or deficit. So some countries export more than they import. They have a surplus. There are other countries that import more than they export. They have a deficit. And of course, if you import and export the exact same amount, right, then it would all even out. Uh, but it's rare that it's going to be exact, right? So there's going to be a small deficit or a small surplus. But in aggregate, Right? If you look at all the countries in the world, it's going to equal out because some countries will have a deficit, some countries will have a surplus, and it'll all wash out to zero right? because we're trading with each other. But in general, strong economies have surpluses. Why? Because they produce so much more than they consume. Right? They produce mm. extra, and they're able to sell their extra production to consumers in other countries. And they earn a profit, right? So a trade surplus is kind of like a profit, a country that's operating at a profit. When a country has a deficit, it generally means that the country is weak because they're not producing enough and they're relying on the stronger economies abroad to produce what they can't. Now, normally, if a nation is running a deficit, the deficits can't get that big because it'll put downward pressure on their currency, upward pressure on their local interest rates and inflation, and that will cause the country to uh, import less. It will re result in more savings and more capital investment to produce more uh, to kind of balance out the deficit. The problem is mm -hmm. the United States has kind of been insulated from the market dynamics because the US dollar is the reserve currency. And no matter how big our deficits got, we could just print the money to cover the, the shortfall. And, and so the deficits have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. We got a trade deficit number out today, the worst deficit in U.S. history. Uh, we got the merchandise trade deficit last week, the biggest trade deficit in U.S. history. You know, Donald Trump correctly, when he ran, pointed out, you know, that we were losing on trade, that this was a big problem. And the problem got bigger during his presidency. He didn't solve it. It got worse. And now it's worse still. Now it's uh, the, the worst <laughs> deficits ever. And, yeah. you know, this is part of the problem. This is the major imbalance. And when you have double deficits, when you have a budget deficit and a trade deficit simultaneously, uh, that's really lethal for the dollar because we're flooding the world with dollars that the world doesn't need to buy American products. Now, what are they doing with their dollars? Well, they're buying Tesla with them. They're buying our overpriced momentum stocks. They used to buy treasuries but they're not dumb enough to do that anymore. The yields are too low. So they're buying our momentum stocks, but that's about it. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, the, the bubble's going to pop and, uh, you know, there's going to be nothing they're going to do with those dollars. They're just going to be dumping them on the foreign exchange market and the dollar's exchange rate is going to crash. And, you know, the, the, the economists always try to spin the budget deficits. And they say, oh, it's because our economy is so strong, we have these deficits. Our consumers are out there spending. You know, if the economy was strong, they would be spending the money on the stuff we made. Our strong economy would be producing. You know, when America really had a strong economy, we had trade surpluses. We had trade surpluses for decades. And we, we used those surpluses to become the world's richest creditor nation. 
There's something called creditor nations and there are debtor nations. Creditor nations are nations where the world owes that nation money, where Americans have more foreign assets than foreigners have American assets. That would be creditor. At one point, even in 1980, America was the wealthiest creditor nation in the world, right? And mm -hmm. how did we become so rich? By investing our trade surpluses, right? We, we became this very rich country. Today, not only is America the world's biggest debtor country, but we owe more money than all the other debtor nations of the world combined. That's how wow. broke we are. You know, that's how screwed up we are uh, after decades of big government financed by uh, Fed money printing. So how do we solve that? I mean, because I guess the first question I have actually is why is it bad for us to produce things in China or Vietnam or India where we can get it made for pennies on the dollar? We can't get somebody here to work for $2 an hour, but we can get somebody over there to work a very good job for 2 or $4 an hour. Uh, so we can produce our products cheaper. Wouldn't that make everything more expensive if we made everything in the States? It, it will. And yeah, you know, it's a great deal as long as the Chinese are dumb enough to, to, you know, to continue it because they're doing all the work and we're getting all the stuff. Um, now, the reality is, you know, they're getting dollars and they think they're getting something, but in reality, they're getting nothing. So the problem isn't that we're able to exploit the rest of the world and get them to do all of our work for us. The problem is that we can't count on that forever. And that eventually, when they cut us off, now we're in a lot of trouble because we don't have the industries anymore. You know, we don't have the, the infrastructure. Um, you know, if you want to think of it as an example, what if there's, you know, people that are living on this island and you know they all are fishing and, and and then they eat the fish and then another somebody comes along and says look don't bother fishing we'll just give you these fish you know go and have fun you know have more leisure you know we'll just give you these fish to eat and you know after several generations like nobody remembers how to fish because everybody is used to getting free fish and then what if the free fish stop coming and yeah. nobody nobody has any rods no one has any nets no one knows what to do and so they all starved to death because they were they they built an economy where they were dependent on somebody else providing them with what they used to provide themselves. So, you know, if the dollar crashes because the world doesn't want to exchange their goods and labor for our paper, how does America just start producing? I mean, we're, you know, if we had to make all of our own uh, you know, stuff, where would the factories come from to produce it? Where would the supply chains come from? Where would the materials come from? We don't even have the workers that are trained to operate the machines. Um, so how would we retool? How would we retrain the entire workforce? I mean, it could be done over time. It could take decades. But, you know, in the meantime, where would we get our stuff? Well, we'd have to go without it. You know, the only reason that we can consume all this stuff right now is because the rest of the world is willing to produce it for us. But if they're not, um, then we, we, we're, we're just SOL. So right now we're in a situation where we're essentially able to create this money out of thin air because a lot of people haven't been producing. This money gets printed out of thin air. People get this money. They buy things that are made overseas. The countries overseas and the companies overseas accept these dollars made out of thin air, produce products for us, send us the products here, and now we're reliant on countries and companies that are working overseas to produce these products for us, and we're forgetting how to produce these products. And then if we ever hit a point where nobody accepts the dollar because they say the dollar isn't worth as much as we thought it was, now we have a problem. Right, is and that, right that now, kind of like the what they're doing with all those dollars that we're sending them is they're buying our bonds, they're buying our stocks, right? But you know, eventually, right, they'll own everything. If we keep on doing this forever, we will have sold off everything we have to the rest of the world, right? We'll be tenants in our own country because the rest of the world wow. will own all our real estate, all of our stocks, right? But obviously, before that happens, they're going to give up because they're going to see the inflation, how much money we're printing. And of course, there's always a lot of risk because the foreigners don't vote in our elections, you know? <laughs> so I would be worried 
if the foreigners own too much of our assets, because you know what happens? Countries nationalize stuff, right? They default, they steal, uh, they rip off their foreign creditors. It's usually very popular with the voters when you're screwing uh, foreigners because, you know, they can't vote. And so it gets very <laughs> risky when uh, the rest of the world owns too much of our stuff. Uh, yeah, that, I think that's a concern that, you know, people have been talking about in the real estate market, especially people and countries overseas buying real mm -hmm. land and properties in the, in the United States. And I know that's been a political debate for years. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. I don't know. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your time. This was a very fun interview. It was a very intense interview at points. Mm -hmm. I'm going to link our, uh, your, your podcast. I will link your YouTube channel in the description. Is there any last remarks you'd like to leave with our audience? Yeah, definitely make a habit of listening to my podcasts on a regular basis, The Peter Schiff Show. I usually do two or three a week. Uh, you can listen at SchiffRadio.com on my YouTube channel. Uh, any place, you know, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever they have uh, podcasts. Follow me on social media. You know, I do a lot of tweeting. You know, um, I'm up to almost 600,000 followers. So a lot of engagement. A lot of people in the crypto community uh, like to uh, uh, troll my tweets. So you'll get a lot of interesting. Uh, <laughs> do you like the trolling? Do you like when people sure, troll you? Know, you or I, mean, is that, yeah, uh... I get a kick out of it, you know. But I like more interesting comments, not just, you know, you know, uh, okay, boomer stuff or like memes, but I mean, uh. at least be a little bit more thoughtful with your with your criticism. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, so you know, go and look for Peter Schiff um, and follow me there. And most importantly, too, if you have money, if you have big crypto profits, you know, you should be contacting me to help you manage those profits. Don't leave it all, you know, on the table uh, where you're going to lose it all back. You know, bank some of it. Let's make some real investing just in case I'm right. You don't go completely broke. And, you know, invest internationally. There's a lot of opportunities in foreign stocks, emerging markets, commodities, gold and silver. So you can contact my representatives. You can either go to Europe Pacific Capital, which is europac.com, uh, with a broker dealer, or go directly to my asset management company, uh, EPAC Funds, EPAC Funds.com. Uh, we're based out of Puerto Rico. And in fact, if you have brokerage accounts, uh, you know, my mutual funds, I've got five mutual funds that you can read about on the Europac Funds website. Uh, they're available on those platforms. You can buy them in your existing uh, brokerage account or you're welcome to open one up with, with my firm and, and have us do it for you. And I also manage uh, individual accounts of uh, individual stocks, not funds. So if you prefer to be in the stocks directly, uh, we manage global portfolios. We give you access to markets that most firms uh, don't give you exposure to. And, uh, you know, we don't just buy what's listed in the U.S. We trade on all the markets so we can find the best values in the best uh, currencies. Thank you so much, Peter. I, everybody, if you're watching this video, you need to go check out Peter's YouTube channel or his podcast. There's so much value in every single episode that you release. Even if people don't agree, you need to go and listen to what Peter has to say. He is very knowledgeable in everything that he talks about. Thank you, Peter, All right. for your time and for this discussion. We'll My talk pleasure. soon. Take care. If you enjoyed this video, here's a video on cryptocurrency that I think you'll love. And while you're in it, join our free finance and business newsletter. And as always, keep hustling. These buyers are pushing real estate prices up so fast that home prices are growing way faster than wages. So you have home prices that are shooting up, you have lots of people out of a job, and this is being fueled by low interest rates because everyone's trying to take advantage of these cheap mortgage rates.